As you know, there'll be at least one trans woman in the Olympics this summer um, being a, someone who's a weightlifter. What are your thoughts about that? Well, the whole transgender um, issue in women's sports is really complicated. And the, the general public does not generally, um, hasn't been educated as to what all the pieces are. So maybe I should start with um, the first piece, which is that when Title IX passed in the mid 1975, uh, 1970s, um, it was an anti-discrimination law. You can't discriminate on the basis of sex with one exception. In this biological space called sport, and only within competitive sport, not intramurals, not recreation, not for fun kinds of things, but in competitive sport, separate sex sport was allowed and a space was, uh, was created. And that space was created to protect biological females because at the onset of puberty, um, males um, um, undergo a tremendous surge in testosterone. Um, as a result, and this hormone is very powerful, it is actually a prohibited substance in, in sport. You can't take testosterone like steroids, right? Um, but it makes men have longer and most dense, uh, more dense bones, more muscle tissue, more hemoglobin, which is the oxygen carrying part of the blood. And these are things that really matter in sport. And it gives males post puberty, eight to 20% sport, sport, sports performance advantages. And Congress understood that if you, boys and girls had to try out for one team, and it was a co-ed team, that very few girls would get a chance to be selected because boys would always be bigger and stronger. And sport is all about propelling an object through space or overcoming the resistance of a mass. It is all about strength, speed, reaction time. So this space was created, girls and women's sport. That being said, trans girls, uh, anyone who's born female, and uh, I'm sorry, born male, and uh, wants to uh, identify as female should be welcome in women's sports. And I'm a member of a group called the Women's Sports Policy Working Group uh, that has created a, a model so that trans girls could fairly participate um, in girls and women's sports. So that being said, people have to first understand that all, not, uh, all trans girls are not the same. Uh, most folks don't know that uh, trans girls and women make different decisions about whether or not they even want to go through puberty. And if they do go through puberty, they make decisions whether or not they want to change their bodies, either by taking um, female affirming hormones like estrogen or to change themselves surgically to remove the male testes, for instance. Uh, so there are three real categories of trans girls that need to be accommodated in women's sports if we want them to play uh, in this protected space without disadvantaging biological females. So the first category is the trans girl who does not experience male puberty. She has no T advantage. And just so you understand how this happens, it's usually a young person who identifies very early before puberty um, that her uh, uh, gender identity does not match her birth sex. And together with her family and her doctors, they decide that um, let's wait until she's an adult and they put her on um, puberty blockers. So it, it um, stalls the onset of puberty until she's old enough to make an adult decision. And at that point, she may say, I 
I haven't gone through male puberty. I want to go on gender affirming hormones. And so she never experiences puberty. She never gets any of the male sex length advantages. She never gets that spurt of testosterone. She should play in women's sports uh, head to head with all biological females. And for all intents and purposes, that is fair competition. The second category of trans girls is the girl uh, starts puberty and makes the decision to mitigate to lessen her advantage. And she does this in either, in either of two ways, by taking hormones or by surgically changing her body. And what this does is get testosterone down into the female range. And the female range is very low. It's like less than two nanomoles. Don't even worry about what nanomoles are, but it's a little, little bit of testosterone. Uh, where males are in the 7 to 25 nanomole range, and there's no overlap. So this is a significant mitigation of advantage. That being said, right, if that person meets the international standard to be eligible for the female category, uh, which is set in nanomoles, this is set by the International Sport Federation or the Olympic Committee, uh, as the entry el eligibility factor to Olympic uh, women's sports, for instance, then she can play just like the girl who never goes through puberty. She can compete equally with males, um, with females, uh, biological females. The last category is the problematic category. And it's okay. There are some trans girls who don't want to change their body. They're afraid of hormones. They don't want to go on hormones. They just identify as female and want to, to be accepted in this construct of women's sports. And we propose that the way to do that is to have that girl be a part of the team. Think about sports, sports, competitive sports. 90% of it is a social construct. Uh, you're, you're practicing together. You have team meetings together, you're traveling together. A minuscule portion of what you do is competition, right? It's once a week for maybe an hour or two, right? Or twice a week, depending on your sport. So we propose that that girl uh, be allowed to participate in women's sports, but be separately scored. What does that mean? What does that you know, look like? What it would look like is, um, for instance, everybody's uh, uh, familiar with the US Open in golf. There is a professional um, uh, sports uh, category scoring pattern, and you could be an amateur. And there are two trophies at the end, right? They play in the same course, they play the same game, they're part of the same competition. At the end, there are two winners, right? One for uh, pros, one for um, uh, for uh, amateurs. So picture women's sports, let's get, say the high jump event, right? So at the high jump, everybody looks the same. Everybody kind of is waiting to get the bar and to t uh, get the bar changed and to take their turn at a jump. Uh, you go until the very last jump. At the end of the competition, you have to uh, scores. Right. You, right. you have one for open, you have one for um, uh, for the protected biological category. This is not the only thing women's sports needs to accommodate. What about the trans boy who does not want to go through hormone therapy or surgery? The trans boy, born female, not wanting to, to take hormones has a biological female body. That trans boy should also be allowed to participate in girls and women's sports if they want to, right? That, that's a biological female. This is protected space in sport for a biological female body. And then you've all, all heard, I think, of non-binary individuals, right? They don't want to identify as males or females. Right, you you would treat them depending on 
their status after puberty, right? Did you go through puberty? You didn't go through puberty. Did you successfully mitigate? Did you not want to mitigate, right? Um, and, and so this is the complexity of the transgender issue in sport, and we have to deal with it sensitively, but sen sensibly, and still have to protect the biological uh, you know, female. Can you sort of sum that up, what that means? Uh, so right now, the issue is at its extremes. There are those, there are states that are saying, there's a state law that you have to participate in girls sports supporting according to your birth sex and they exclude transgender girls completely, no matter what their status is, right? And you can see where that discriminates against trans girls who don't have uh, a male sex link advantage. And then there are, uh, there's a position of trans organizations that say, we want trans girls to be treated identically. Uh-uh, no two, no two trophies. You have to treat them identically all the time. And that uh, throws out the protection of the biological female category. And what we're saying is we've got to play in the middle. We've got to listen to science and we have to go, we have to protect biological females. We have to understand the, the position of the transgender girl to see whether she has advantage or not. Has there been research at least to show that if a transgender woman went through puberty as a boy, that even if you work with hormones, there's still been a greater buildup of bone and muscle mass? Yes, and this, this comes in the middle. Um, the answer to the question, did you successfully mitigate? And what we know is that um, this is what you're describing is called legacy advantage. That no matter what hormones you take, you can't get rid of the muscle mass that you developed at, when you went through puberty. And it's still an advantage, which is why uh, we're saying that we have to go according to the standards that are set by the International Sport Federation by sport and by event. We know that that muscle mass, the advantages will be greater in contact sports, in strength-based sports, weightlifting, power sports, the sprinting events, and they will be less in the distance event. And that is where research really has not caught up yet in the sense that what should the standard be by event and by sport? Does that, does that make sense? I mean, we, okay. we know we have to protect the biological female, but what is successful mitigation is that's where the research is being done right now. The latest research on military, large numbers of military transgender individuals tell us that uh, we probably have to have transgender girls, for instance, stay on hormones for a longer period of time than was originally thought. Like the NCA rule is you have to get your hormone level down continuously for 12 months. That military research is saying it's probably more like two years. So um, there's still this flux. And the, the point is, can we do the best job we can to protect biological females and to make sure that all transgender women are welcome in women's sports? When you first started sort of looking at this and looking at the different categories, was there backlash? Was it, was it called transphobic at all? Well, there's no question that anyone who takes a position against identical treatment is called transphobic. It's a, it's a very toxic environment right now. And it's so toxic with both parties at the extremes that unfortunately people aren't listening to each other and they're not coming to this common ground. Legally, what I've been talking about in terms of um, how to accommodate that one type 
of transgender individual who has the, still has the advantage is called an accommodation. So we're, we're talking about designing a girl sport structure that accommodates one type of transgender girl who has um, um, an immutable advantage. And that would be to have a second category for a win. That's right, to have an open category. So everybody would compete, but that that trans girl would could only win the the open category. That only a biological female could open uh, could win uh, the biological female category. And, and and I don't want to mislead you. This is not about winning. This is about every girl feeling they have a fair chance to test their competencies. Um, I, I grew up an athlete and I beat all the boys on my street up until I was about 12 years old. <laughs> and that was it then, right? And I went on to be successful in sport only because there was separate sport. So how do we um, make sure that a girl has that first success experience? And it's not winning. It may be getting a hit. It may be winning a preliminary race. It may be testing herself and seeing her potential. I can be as good as that person. But if, if we have uh, transgender uh, girls with advantage who a girl looks at and says, there's no way that I can compete you know, on this, the same track or the same whatever. That's when girls decide to drop out of sport. So it's about making sure that there's this place that's a fair place for, for girls. And you, you would understand too, that there's a safety consideration in collision sports, mm -hmm. uh, which is why, for instance, the International Rugby, uh, World Rugby Association uh, has said trans girls cannot be on rugby teams, uh, girls rugby teams, but they are now looking at developing uh, trans girl, girls, uh, trans girl rugby team uh, that would uh, not be at the club level, but might be at the province or the district level um, in the same way as we deal with handicapped sports. If I only have two or three kids in wheelchairs, right? Instead of having a wheelchair basketball team at my school, I have a district world wheelchair basketball team to play against other school districts. So there are solutions here, but they require people who are committed to including trans uh, girls fairly to sit down and figure it out. Um, and, and, and that's what's not happening right now. Too much yelling and not listening going on. I that's find right. it very interesting that Generally, the people who are against trans um, women playing in sports weren't truly the supporters of Title IX. Well, yes, I, I don't think there's any question that there's transphobia at play behind these state laws that simply want to say, I'm sorry, you've got to play sport according to your birth sex and who do not want to recognize gender identity at all. They don't want to bother. And if so social justice is important, if it's just as important um, to recognize biological sex and, and your gender identity, then we've got to make sure that both can be accommodated under the women's sports umbrella. Are you still working to get this compromise? Oh, absolutely. And, um, you know, one of the reasons the Women's Sports Policy Group got together is we're all a little older. We're all kind of former uh, athletes. And we're not in the position of current athletes where people threaten their sponsors. Uh, uh, and, you know, they, they engage in this toxic warfare. Uh, and so current athletes are afraid to speak out because. They don't want to deal with this. The, 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 the young girls in Connecticut who uh, brought a lawsuit, um, they were really chastised in social media, death threats, the, the whole business. 
we can't be in that place and come out with a good decision. So we've got our work cut, cut out for us. So okay. are you looking forward to seeing what happens with the uh, situation with the Olympics? Yes, I think, you know, Saunders is a great athlete, weightlifter, um, you know, a trans girl that appears to have legacy advantage. Um, and she probably has her um, testosterone down into the female range. But there's an example of a 35-year-old who, you know, lived a life with this testosterone advantage and still has the strength and the muscle mass that uh, gives her an advantage over other girls. We think that is, is you know, at play here. Um, so I suspect that if trans girls are successful anywhere in the Olympic Games, that uh, that's going to precipitate public education and say, why is this? It's going to uh, force all of the international sport federations to really pay attention to science and to come up with the right rule for their sport. Right now, people are avoiding making rules because they're afraid of the reaction, a social justice reaction of the trans community. Uh, and, I, and I'm hopeful that the Olympic Games provides the impetus for the international sport federations to do their scientific homework and to set fair standards by sport, by event.